in the 23rd Prime Minister's own words, a cabinet that looks like Canada. Joining us now for their views on the selections and what they say about Justin Trudeau's Liberal government in the nation's capital via Skype, there's Christy Kirkup, parliamentary reporter with the Canadian Press, and with us here in studio, Herschel Ezrin, senior counsel for global public affairs, who himself, 30 years ago, helped select a cabinet when he was principal secretary to Premier David Peterson. Christy, good to have you on the program again. Herschel, lovely to see you yeah. too. Let's just, I know uh, it's been a couple of days and everybody's had a chance to digest these names, but for old time's sake, Mr. Director, if you would, let's bring this highlight package up here. Some of Trudeau's bigger choices. There's Bill Morneau in finance, a rookie. Stéphane Dion with an opportunity for a good third act in public life and foreign affairs. Carolyn Bennett, indigenous and northern affairs. Catherine McKenna, another rookie. Environment and climate change, which has been added to the name. Jane Philpott, another rookie at health. Christian Freeland, another rookie at international trade. Okay, let's. those are some of the bigger names. Obviously, the cabinet's bigger than that. In terms of an overarching principle, Herschel, what did the Prime Minister say in the choices he made? Well, he had to demonstrate real change to the public, and that was beyond age, gender, and diversity, which could either be ethnicity or ge geography, which are some of the things that one always looks at. The other thing that he tried to do was to go back to the trust card. How do you build a trust relationship that with a government that will be open and transparent? And I think that that occurs in two different ways, both by the kinds of people that he's involved and also by the structures that he's built in government. I think it's quite remarkable that he's changed the cabinet structure, much more than I think people actually expected. We're going to come back to that okay. in a second. Uh, Christy, to you, same observation. Uh, is there an overarching principle you see at play here with these choices? Uh, certainly, as you mentioned, uh, obviously we, we see that uh, Justin Trudeau has uh, reached out to ensure, of course, that uh, half of the cabinet is made up of women and half is made up of men. But uh, as Herschel mentioned, I really think that Justin Trudeau really had to kind of put his money where his mouth was in terms of signaling uh, that real change, because that really was the sales pitch during the course of the election campaign. So he had to come through on that. And we really saw that even in the way that uh, the cabinet arrived uh, at uh, Rideau Hall. Of course, they all arrived together on a bus uh, and uh, they walked up together. And of course, that was a, a planned photo op and, and they're going uh, for that photo op. But again, it was kind of that message about uh, Justin Trudeau maybe leaning on, on the members of his team that are you know, behind him and were literally standing right behind him. And uh, it will be really interesting to see um, in terms of, of their power how much power they will have uh, in, in their portfolios. And uh, I, I think that we actually will see some pretty active ministers uh, within this uh, front bench, Steve. All right. I'm going to pick up, Herschel, on what you were saying a second ago, because, you know, we, sure. we, you can't tell the players without a program, and we've seen the program. We know who the players are. One of the things we don't see are the subcommittees of Cabinet and how they operate. You've had a chance to look at some of the lists, some of the ways they've changed things up. What caught your attention? Well, first of all, there are more committees of cabinet than before. Is that a good thing? Well, it could delay things on occasion, but what it really does is it gives different cabinet ministers an opportunity to actually put their five cents worth in on a lot of different subjects. He's also established um, a subcommittee on Canada-U.S. relations. Uh, chaired by Christian Freeland, which is quite interesting because that, I think, signals the importance that he has in getting that relationship on a different track than perhaps it's been in the past. And, of course, you look at some of the cabinet committees, uh, especially he now calls it agenda and results. In, the, in other days, it was planning and priorities. This is the real powerhouse. And seeing the people that are on that list, there's a, quite a large number of new faces on that list, again, reflecting the fact that the government is going to be different than uh, the same old cr crew. Uh, I pointed out in the opening, uh, Christy, that the Minister of the Environment is now called the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. The Ontario government made the same change when Kathleen Wynne swore in her ministry. Is that a big deal? 
Well, I think that uh, the Liberal government will be under a great deal of pressure, especially with the upcoming climate change conference that's happening in Paris. And Catherine McKenna is going to be taking that on as really her first uh, major role uh, on uh, this portfolio. So certainly, I think in terms of messaging, uh, that that was, of course, deliberate. Environment and climate change, especially as she's uh, looking at this uh, major climate change conference. And there will be a, a tremendous amount of pressure on Canada to determine targets. What will the target be? Herschel, there are some really interesting choices in as much as the Minister of Health is a doctor, the Minister of Science is a scientist, the Minister of Defense is a veteran, the Minister of Transportation is an astronaut, the Minister of Finance is a Bay Street financial guy, a pension expert. Some people, when they put cabinets together, think it's better if you actually don't align people who come from that sector to be in charge of that sector. They think you're somehow captive to your stakeholders or your former colleagues. Uh, what do you think on that front? Uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If, if you don't put expertise in, um, such as people who understand the financial services sector and the financial institutions, you get everybody in that sector saying, oh, the government won't understand what our needs are. If you do it, you get the same charge that, that you, you just uh, laid. I think you've got to find a balancing act, and I, I think he's done a good job. Uh, but the proof of the pudding is always in the eating here, and one has to find out exactly what's going to happen as these ministers, who are very capable people he drew from a good talent pool, actually get to work and you'll see if they're good parliamentarians and uh, good communicators. You know, a minister is more than just a subject expert. There is a chief operating officer in every department. That's called a deputy minister. Mm -hmm. What you really want are people who are going to make sure if the political agenda is kept to, if they're going to drive it, if they're going to be able to engage stakeholders, and if they're going to be able to be a good public face for the, for the government of the day. And I think that's what's going to be important in judging whether these people are effective or not. And presumably being able to get stuff through. Uh, always uh, that is the case and with an agenda that is so massive as the one that they have expectations are going to be the biggest problem that they face. Christy I want to ask you about Carolyn Bennett and in doing so we want to do the full disclosure thing here. Carolyn Bennett is the mem member of parliament for the riding in which this television station is situated. Her husband Peter O'Brien is the chairman of the board of TVO and we get that out there in the interest of full disclosure. Um, having said that she's now the minister for indigenous and northern affairs I don't think anybody's going to argue about her bona fides on the indigenous file. There's probably nobody in that parliament who's better suited to do that job than she is. Having said that, I wonder how people in the north of this country are going to take the news that somebody who represents a riding in midtown to downtown Toronto is now in charge of northern affairs. You hearing anything about that? I haven't heard anything on that print. One, I, one thing I think about Carolyn Bennett is that um, she's she's really able to connect with people. And I know that might sound kind of hokey, but she really wears her, her heart on her sleeve. And she really has made it her mission over uh, the, the last number of years, especially uh, working as the, the critic on this file, to make connections within Indigenous communities. And I think she has been quite successful at uh, doing that. So seeing her take over this file, again, this is going to be, um, you know, this is going to be key for the Liberals to get right. What we're looking at, especially when it comes to an inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women, the Liberals have vowed that they will move forward immediately on this promise, and uh, this is to the tune of $40 million over the course of two years. But uh, really, when it comes down to it, the first step that we're hearing, um, you know, uh, grassroots groups call for is that consultation process to figure out what will the roadmap look like? What will this inquiry actually entail? And so I think when it comes to, uh, again, consulting with First Nations about this inquiry, about what it should entail, I do think that Carolyn Bennett is very diplomatic and she will be strong when it comes to, uh, again, kind of making those personal connections that are very, very important uh, on this file especially when, when you're speaking to um, victims' families. Right, Steve. and Christy, let me jump in on this. Um, again, I don't know whether to read a lot of this or read nothing at all into it. Uh, the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, as it then was, is now the Ministry for Indigenous Affairs. What's that supposed to signpost? 
Well, certainly I was speaking to uh, the the Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Belgard, and he did suggest that it was significant. And I think uh, in terms of tone, again, the Liberals are really trying to get this portfolio right. Uh, the Conservatives really had strained relationships, to say the very least, uh, with uh, First Nations. Uh, there were uh, a number of pieces of legislation uh, that, that were being uh, challenged in court. Uh, and and uh, in terms of the actual relationship, we really saw, you know, the uh, tension play out, especially during Idle No More. And so I think that what the Liberals are trying to do is they're trying to be very, very proactive. And they're trying to ensure that, again, when it comes to the name of the ministry, when it comes to the person they're putting uh, at the front of this file, that, uh, again, they're being very deliberate about the fact that they want uh, to come through on that change that they promised during the course of the election gotcha. campaign. Uh, Steve, sure. there, there, there's, uh, Christy has made a really important point here because what is going on right now is a long game for the, for the new government as well. If we're going to get a lot of different kinds of economic development, read pipelines, read a lot of other things like that, we're going to have to come to some kind of agreement and they're going to have to do that with uh, the Aboriginal peoples who have all kinds of issues. And, and it's not just a robust regulatory system. It's recognition of certain rights in certain situations. The more that they can do to establish a trust relationship on related or unrelated files, actually, mm. the better the chance that they can actually have discussions, which were lacking in the past, over some of these other issues. So it's really in the interest of economic development that they're playing the long game. Let me go through a series, uh, Herschel, with you of kind of um, red flags that they have pledged to move on. And I want to know right. from your experience, you know, for example, like how much time should we give Carolyn Bennett before she calls that missing and murdered Aboriginal women's inquiry? How uh, long should they, should they be given? To? I don't think that, um, well, the problem in all of this is getting the terms of reference right. and. The challenge that you always have is that you can probably get 85% of it right fairly quickly, mm -hmm. and it's getting the next 5%. They never get 100% right. But to get the next 5% could take them months. And I think they're going to err on the side of speed and, so get it up and, rolling and quickly. acknowledge that they don't cover exactly everything. Uh, but I think they have to have a consultation process, as was mentioned, mm -hmm. and they're going to go ahead quickly with okay. that. Okay. What about Ralph Goodale? He's in charge of C-51 now, I gather. Right. I mean, how quickly should he be getting parliamentary hearings going and get the amendments put forward that they campaigned on? Well, I think the, uh, the issue there is they've got, a, you know, they've got some real bench strength in this area. Uh, uh, people like Marco Mendicino, who I mentioned before, and others, who was a federal prosecutor on the Toronto 18. They've got a lot of people who know about this issue, so I think they can contribute to the process. But it's the question of expectations. How much are we going to be all pressing them? You know, in this um, internet age and social media where every 10 seconds they haven't responded yet, why not? <laughs> can, they, can they manage to live through that? Okay, how about John McCallum? He's now Immigration and Refugee Minister. They've pledged 25,000 Syrian refugees. How long do we give him to bring that forward? Um, I think that uh, there's a general consensus that 25,000 before Christmas is a, an aspirational goal rather than a, um, something that they can actually pull off. Having said that, uh, the best minds in the government are going to be working on trying to get this done as fast as possible. And as long as people see that progress is being made and that files are not being held for months in the prime minister's office or something like that, I think they're, they're going to be tolerant of uh, change. Christy, it is often the case on cabinet swearing in day that you focus, obviously, on who's in. It's not often the case that you focus on who's out. And let's, a couple of days after the fact, now do that because there are some very big names that I think a lot of people expected to be in that cabinet that didn't end up there. Andrew Leslie, uh, whose father and I think grandfather were both defense ministers and I guess a lot of people thought he was going to be there. Uh, the former chief of police in Toronto, Bill Blair, didn't make it. Bob Nault, former Indian Affairs Minister, one of the, uh, uh, you know, very few non-urban on uh, uh, MPs in Ontario didn't make it. Adam Vaughn from downtown Toronto didn't make it. Seamus O'Regan from The Rock didn't make it. Um, what's the chatter in Ottawa about uh, why these folks didn't make it in? I think that there are different reasons for each of the, the different individuals that, that you just listed. I think with Andrew Leslie, 
I will say that I was pretty surprised that he didn't end up on Trudeau's front bench. Uh, I actually uh, spent uh, election night with Andrew Leslie uh, in in Ottawa. He uh, took uh, the riding, a suburban riding of Orleans, and uh, I kind of pitched going to that riding, of course, because I thought that Andrew Leslie uh, was definitely uh, going to to end up in cabinet, uh, and there uh, certainly was a great de uh, degree of chatter about that. Um, there were some concerns about uh, the degree to which he could communicate. He had, uh, you know, there there was a, a time where he, he spoke at a Liberal convention and, uh, you know, there was a suggestion maybe that he had some difficulty addressing some of the pointed questions from journalists. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure um, why he didn't end up in Cabinet other than uh, perhaps, again, um, he he is um, uh, male and also I, I think there, there could have been a bit of baggage there. There's a lot of paperwork when it comes to things he was calling for with regards uh, to, to change in the military. So maybe again, it just ended up being being too much. I was surprised about Adam Vaughn as well. I think that he kind of represents maybe a progressive arm of the Liberal Party. And there were some progressives that maybe were wooed to the Liberal Party uh, during the course of this election that were hoping to see someone like Adam Vaughn uh, play a, a big role in cabinet. Uh, so that was another uh, surprise. So uh, again, I think it really comes down to the fact that uh, Trudeau uh, really wanted to to show again that that change. And when it came down to it, of course, these people will, will play a key role in, in the new caucus of sure. 184 MPs. But, Herschel, um, let me, let me uh, figure this out with you. Uh, going back to your experience, yes. when you were making cabinets with David Peterson 30 years ago, if somebody thinks they're probably going to be in and they're not in, do you call them ahead of time and you say, wanted you, couldn't do it this time, hang in there, maybe next time? Well, you, you have to do that because you have to play the honesty card from the beginning with people, but you have to do two other things. You have to find important things for them to do. There are parliamentary secretaryships. There are uh, perhaps task forces that are going to be, and I would be very surprised if Adam Vaughn, for example, didn't end up with some kind of task force or committee responsibility that was going to deal with the issue of housing, which is a very uh, important one. Let me just for stop him. you there. You say you have to find something special and important for these folks to do. Why? Well, because of the fact that they, they were motivated to run because they were going to be able to contribute. And you want to make sure that they feel that they can contribute in a way that's commensurate with, the, with their even perhaps their own perceptions of, of how well they should be doing. But the, the real cabinet shuffle that's going to bother people, you can explain not being in this cabinet shuffle, uh, uh, the, uh, the gender balance, uh, the fact that I didn't have enough parliamentary experience, et cetera, et cetera. The hard one to explain to people is the cabinet shuffle that occurs about a year and a half before you go into the next election, when the prime minister is going to have lined up whoever he wants on his the best front bench that he can find to go into the next election. If you don't make that cut, that's a harder one to hmm. explain. And now, hmm. uh, already, we are, it's funny, even before the government was sworn in, so sworn in Wednesday, I yeah. think on Tuesday, it emerged that Adam Vaughn, since we're talking about him here, reiterated there can be no jets at the island airport, Billy Bishop Airport, in the south end of Toronto. And, of course, Bombardier's in big trouble right now. And they've already gone to the federal government, or will be soon, saying, oh, yeah. you know, we want a billion-dollar backstop to help us do this. And, of course, Bombardier's not going to be able to hang in there unless they get the order from Porter for new jets at the island. Trudeau, he's, he's got a dilemma on his hands already. Do I go with Adam Vaughn, who said no jets, or do I go with my 40 Quebec MPs who want jets in order to save those 45,000 jobs in Quebec? How does anybody resolve that conundrum? Well, welcome to governing. Right. I mean, this is the whole issue. Uh, and, and these come out of left field. You don't even know when they're going to come. Um, uh, someone that I know quite well described it as, uh, uh, you know, prime ministers actually have to deal with the day-to-day -day part of the job in, as well as all of the things that they say they're going to do. And one of the challenges here is exactly what you pointed out, and it's one of the first ones on the government's agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know there's been a lot of conversation about this already, um, you know, in all the media, but we should talk about it because it's an historic development. Uh, it's a 50-50 cabinet in terms of gender balance, and uh, it's something the Prime Minister promised and made good on. Let's check a clip out of him, and then we'll talk. Roll it, please, Sheldon.
La mesure qui favorise les femmes, c'est que j'ai dit très clairement qu'on va avoir 50 de notre cabinet des ministres euh, qui va être formé de femmes. Ce symbole-là euh, et, et cette, cette action-là euh, va aller très loin vers euh, l'encouragement de, de plus de femmes de, de s'impliquer parce qu'elles vont pouvoir faire une, une vraie différence. Euh, mais en même temps, je reconnais absolument qu'on a beaucoup plus de travail à faire pour atteindre un, un pourcentage respectueux euh, et respectable euh, de femmes en politique et je m'engage à continuer de le faire. OK, Christy. Well, he promised 50-50. He brought in 50-50. Uh, how important was it for him to fulfill that promise? I think it was important, and I think it is significant. Um, it's actually interesting. Uh, when I was out on the campaign uh, covering Justin Trudeau's uh, campaign, uh, there was a, a kind of an awkward moment in Quebec where he caught himself. Um, there were 14 male members, uh, candidates, that were standing behind him uh, at uh, this this uh, event. And, uh, you know, there were some questions. It was like the elephant in the room. Well, what, what are you doing? doing with 14 men standing behind you if you're campaigning on this idea of change. And of course, he said, well, no, 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 uh, wait a minute. We have promised that there will be 50% men and 50% women in cabinet. So just thinking back to that moment out on the campaign trail where, he, again, he, he uh, emphasized that point, you know, I think it was really uh, important for him uh, to, to come through on that promise. And again, as you mentioned, uh, he, he certainly did that. Herschel, there are so many different, you know, pieces to the recipe of putting mm -hmm. together a good cabinet, right? The, it's not just gender diversity. You've got to get all the regions the represented. The red-haired, left-handed, uh, yeah. You know, provinces, every province yeah. has got to be in there, um, you know, ethnic backgrounds and so on. Um, how well did he do at, or let me put it this way, in fulfilling the commitment to make the cabinet 50-50, how problematic has that been? Uh, in terms of all the rest of what he needed to achieve? Um, I, I think he's really done a splendid job from what I've been able to see over the last couple of days. Um, uh, again, uh, these people have to perform, and that is always the final uh, uh, test. But he's been able to balance uh, the, the geographic necessities of Canada with uh, finding some people with, and he's been very fortunate because he's had a very deep talent pool of this 183 members plus himself who got elected. You know, sometimes you don't have the same talent pool. It's a lot more difficult to do what he did. And, and he's got the raw material. We'll see how well they actually do when they um, get into the House. Let me do one more thing here. And, and the issue of quote unquote merit came up a lot. Here's Andrew Coyne writing in the National Post. Where a thing is truly important to us, like the national hockey team, or to a lesser extent, the Supreme Court, we tend to place relatively greater emphasis on merit. It's only where we have decided an institution is more or less useless, corporate boards, or alas, cabinet, that representationalism takes its place. The more that cabinet has declined in importance, the more attention has focused not on the fitness of a particular individual for a particular job, but on parsing how well different groups are represented within it. Want to comment on that, Herschel? Yeah, I think it's crap. Uh, I, I mean, get off the fence. Tell me what you really think. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, I just think uh, uh, we live. I mean, the prime minister said it very well. We live in 2015. Aspirational goals have not done what they were hope, what we hoped that they would do about involving women um, in the political process. And role models matter. And I, you know, and they are more than 50%. I mean, we're on the minority here, Steve. Uh, women are more than 50% of the population, and it's time that we actually accept that women have an equal role to play. And they're going to change Parliament. They're going to change the way decisions are made, and it's going to be for the better. In our last couple of minutes, I, uh, Christy, since you're going to be covering Parliament Hill, and you're going to be experiencing something that anybody who's covered the Hill Uh, for longer than five years probably has never experienced before. Um, and that is you're going to get to know where cabinet meetings are taking place and you're going to get to talk to cabinet ministers when they emerge from those meetings. That hasn't happened in a very long time. Um, pursuant to that, do you really expect Justin Trudeau is going to give his ministers a freer hand than his predecessor in running their departments? 
I do think that um, Justin Trudeau really has emphasized the fact that he has wanted to to reach out and and build a strong team. And obviously, that was an attempt to try and combat maybe some of the questions about his own experience and whether or not he was up to the job. So uh, what he's trying to really say is, look at all of these talented people that I've put into uh, you know cabinet positions, and uh, he's I, I think going to to give them uh, certainly more free reign uh, than Stephen Harper gave uh, members of his front bench. What will be interesting, as you mentioned, uh, the media will have access to uh, cabinet uh, uh, ministers coming out of cabinet meetings, uh, which which will be very interesting uh, to, to see whether or not they actually are going to be able to go off talking points. One thing we, we saw, obviously, uh, with, uh, you know, the the um, reveal of cabinet was that you know kind of a string of of uh, ministers were brought out before the media and no one really could say anything because they were saying well we have to be briefed by our you know our uh, department and we have to talk to officials so that was interesting because in you know it was a bit of a precarious position to put them into you know you trot them out and everyone has questions about huge files like legalizing marijuana and assisted death and no one could really uh, actually weigh in on the issue so that's what i will be watching for i want to see when we can uh, really hear about uh, substance uh, and certainly we are waiting with uh, bated breath just remember that mistakes will happen i think that we are certain of and secondly the real uh, issue will be how does the prime minister and his core team react to ministers who make mistakes, or will they be saying, please don't make the mistake a second time because that could be really career limiting? So everybody gets a mulligan. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see beyond that. Okay, uh, thanks to the two of you for this. Christy Kirkup, parliamentary reporter for the Canadian Press. Herschel Ezrin, senior counsel, global public affairs, the former principal secretary to Premier David Peterson. Good to see both of you here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.